research and thank you for this kind word. And thank you very much for the organizer who invited me and have shown up to now a very good efficiency. Thank you. Well, uh, I may have uh, some knowledge and experience in the field of international arbitration, but yet I'm a bit surprised that I was asked to talk about approaches to arbitration across the edges. Because whatever be my experience and my age, it doesn't go across the edges. I'm going to say some more about arbitration in the Roman society, the ancient Roman society. I'm not, I'm not going to go so far in the past yet. As we all know, uh, arbitration has a immemorial past, uh, but today it's something unique. Today, uh, arbitration is a normal way of resolving economic disputes internationally, be that in the field of commercial contract, be that in the field of uh, investment protection, be that is in the field of uh, sport competition. So, arbitration is everywhere. And this, I think, is the, the result of a combined action of uh, the private economic circles on the one hand and the state of uh, the states in general on the other hand. If you think of uh, what happened during the last uh, 50 years in order uh, to promote international arbitration, it is really impressive. This starts by the ratification of the New York Convention of 1958 by uh, about 150 states. That's one of the conventions which has been, which has the greatest success in the world, if we think of the number of ratification. The adoption by the United Nations, the UNCTRAL, of uh, their rules of arbitration and then of a model law which has been the uh, basis for the revamping of the international arbitration law throughout the world. Now, today, there are very, very few countries uh, which have still no law on arbitration. During the same period, there has been a lot, a, a cre the creation of a lot of uh, arbitration institutions for the world, uh, sometimes occurring such as mushrooms, uh, some being serious, some being less serious, but you see a huge interest for international arbitration. And in the field of uh, investment uh, protection, the conclusion and ratification of about 3,000 treaties, bilateral treaties, unilateral treaties, with all of them uh, recourse uh, to uh, international arbitration in order to protect the in the in this and arbitration has even expressed today with the global arbitration review uh, which played that role so that's an impressive uh, success yet uh, this uh, success should not hide that today arbitration is under acerb criticism in a recent interview in law Gary Bourne has noted that international arbitration, and here I quote, has enjoyed a long golden summer when everything went right, but that, and no quotation also, between quotation also, winter is coming. <laughs> and that's true, winter is coming. This critic, those critics apply to arbitration in general. Arbitration is said to be too long, too expensive, lack of independence of arbitrators. This is for the general critique. And you have specific criticism for investment arbitration that uh, some people consider as being unacceptable as such because a private person should not control the policy of the states, and you see all the development uh, in the discussion of the treaties uh, between uh, Canada and uh, the, EU, the EU and the United States in the EU. 
and also more specific uh, criticism of the investment arbitration, uh, lack of uh, transparency, lack of predictability, lack of recourse to the appeal, and the problem of the double hats between council and arbitration. So, we have very uh, strong criticism. But such criticism, such criticism should not surprise. After years of uh, adulation of arbitration, it's no more than fair. And when you look through history, you see that there has been a lot of uh, summer for arbitration and some winners, some uh, winners. What I'm going to do is to recall some of these uh, summers, one particular long winter, in order to draw from that some general uh, conclusion and make uh, some progress from the future only as we are talking about time and some forecasts. The summers, or some summers, of arbitration, because I, I cannot go everywhere to look at what happened to arbitration. And maybe before doing that, I think we should be very clear of what I am considering as being arbitration. I'm considering that we are talking about arbitration when we are dealing with the, the third party who is going to give a binding a decision. And that party is the point by the uh, litigant, by the parties, or on their behalf. Just to exclude a number of uh, boards, of courts, which sometimes has been considered to be akin to arbitration, like, let's say, in England, uh, the courts which were maintained by the guilds in the uh, Middle Age, or uh, the uh, court merchant in the feds. I don't think that this was arbitration. They were imposed to the participants in a completely different, even if they were applying different type of law. So let's see uh, the summers, some summers of arbitration. The first one, it, which is very important because it has still some effects today, that what happened in Rome, in the ancient Rome, where arbitration was very, very developed in very specific circumstances. We should not forget that in the ancient Rome, there were no permanent courts of law for centuries. The system was organized as follows. The praetor, who was not a judge, who was somebody uh, administering justice and trust of the administration of justice, when he was uh, confronted with a case, he was appointing a judge, or if asked to be so, an arbitrator. And at the beginning, the difference was not very, very clear between the judex, the judge, and the arbiter, the arbitrator. The main difference was that the arbitrator, the arbiter uh, was uh, supposed to apply the law more, uh, more nicely uh, for the parties than uh, the judge. But the idea was in both cases, uh, the parties were submitted a list of names by the praetor. They were on the list sele uh, making a selection of the arbiter. So we are really in a, in a case of arbitration. What is interesting is that it was a sole existing system and that uh, uh, the system was functioning. Uh, these arbitrators were not paid because during centuries in Rome it was not conceivable that somebody giving, uh, having a quasi-judicial activity be paid. They were citizens, Roman citizens, uh, who were obliged to uh, provide that system to the community. And you see texts uh, of the time where the praetor uh, looked for the arbitrator who doesn't come to work for some reason, you may imagine, maybe a friend of the party, or maybe they do, and finding and obliging to make a decision. So this was, I think, one of the summers of arbitration. And what is interesting also is that in the case of arbitration in Rome, there was no appeal, no recourse whatsoever. 
then you have two other periods where arbitration had its uh, well, more than that, but in history. First, you have France before the, the French Revolution. Here we see the development of arbitration for different reasons than in Rome. In Rome, it was a system, there were no permanent courts, so you have to find a way to, to solve disputes. In the uh, France before uh, the revolution, arbitration was used by the kings to limit the power of the court. There was a constant fight between the kings, all the kings, and the judiciary. And the, the way to limit the power of the judiciary was for the king's arbitration. You have an uh, order of Fontainebleau in uh, 1560 where the king decides that in case of arbitration there will be no appeal unless you have complied with the arbitral award. So if you are condemned to pay, you have to pay and only then you may appeal. And this is very interesting because we have already in France uh, some uh, procedural rules which are exactly the same. For instance, you cannot in France make a recourse to our Supreme Court, the Court the Court de Cassation, without having complied first with the decision of the Court of Appeal. That's exactly the same system. But it was worse with arbitration in this at, the, at this uh, time in France because when, as it was often the case in the uh, contract of the parties providing for arbitration, it was mentioned that a penalty would be paid if you don't comply with the uh, decision of the arbitrators. In this order of Fontainebleau of 1560, it is said that first, to appeal, you have to have complied with uh, the uh, award. But top of that, you must have paid also the penalty. So it was very, very difficult to fight not to respect the arbitration award. In the same uh, order, it is decided that arbitration will be mandatory for members of the same family, for dispute between members of the same family, and also between merchants. And between merchants, no appeal whatsoever was admitted. So this was really a golden time for arbitration. And this, was, this approach was pursued until the, the revolution. There is a royal order of uh, 1673 where it is said that arbitration is mandatory in partnership and in maritime insurance. So you see the, the, the will of succession of kings to affirm arbitration. The problem is that the, the judges were not always respecting these orders because it was a very strange tradition in France, the judge was not obliged to respect the decision of the king unless the king can personally impose the decision. But obviously the king could not travel everywhere, and in practice uh, it was applied or not applied depending on who were the judge. Then come the French Revolution. And here again, that's a golden time for arbitration for different reasons. The first one is that uh, the people, uh, the revolutionaries, they were very, very much influenced by uh, the school of uh, natural law. And the school of natural law was very much in favor of arbitration. In the text by uh, Puffendorf, for instance, you find that arbitration, I'm quoting, is a choice quite guided quite by reason. Decision, arbitration provides decision according to humanity and charity. They were saying things like that. And Russians was saying arbitration is followed by those who like justice and peace. The people behind the revolution, they had these ideas and they wanted to uh, impose arbitration. And at the same time, they had the same distrust as the king before for the judges because the, the judges were from very 
before the revolution, so they wanted to eliminate them. So they made arbitration mandatory, exactly as the king, the law in 1790, between uh, the further relation of uh, people of the same family and a law, very interesting, of uh, 1793 for the re repartition of the assets which has been uh, taken from the nobility. The assets of the nobility were saved everywhere and arbitrators were appointed to make a repartition of this asset among the people of the village. This was arbitration. So we, we see how arbitration may be used. Then there is another type of summer for arbitration. It is the Cold War, the opposition between the then communist country of Eastern Europe and uh, uh, the capitalist country. Because, uh, uh, as you know, in uh, the Marxist uh, philo philosophy, the judiciary is considered as a superstructure which uh, represents the will of the states. Then it was absolutely impossible for uh, the uh, state-owned companies in the communist country <coughs> to accept the jurisdiction of courts from capitalist country. They were an antagonist between both. So this has been at the origin of a great success of arbitration, which was uh, confirmed, crystallized by the European Convention of uh, 1961, where uh, it was uh, organized that arbitration would take place in the relations between uh, these uh, countries from Eastern Europe and country of uh, Western Europe. And this convention, which is still existing, that uh, has lost completely uh, its uh, interest, or partially, partially lost its interest, was used at the time, and in particular, it had a protocol attached to the convention, which was organized in cooperation between uh, the uh, ICC, the International Chamber of Commerce, seen as representing arbitration in the capitalist world, and all the uh, Chamber of Commerce of uh, the uh, European Communist country, where there was an arbitration court. In each country, there was an arbitration court. And I remember that it, this is a period when I was a Secretary General of the SC Court of Arbitration. I was traveling all the time to uh, Warsaw, Prague, uh, Moscow, etc to organize the work together to resolve the, uh, the, the dispute between the French uh, company, German company, and uh, companies of this country. And we may uh, finish the description of the summer solution by uh, what I described at the beginning, what happened in uh, the last part of the 20th century with globalization and as a result a considerable expansion of arbitration for two reasons uh, in the field of commercial arbitration because with the globalization there was a need of uh, a neutral and efficient uh, mean to resolve international dispute and this has been the role of arbitration neutral uh, neutral because culturally, at least, uh, the national courts were not uh, considered as neutral. I'm not talking about impartiality. I'm talking about neutrality intellectually and efficiency because, well, with the success of the New York Convention, it's easier to enforce abroad an arbitral award than the decision of the state court. I'm not going to go into details, but I can justify that very easily. And also in the field of investment arbitration, I would not say in the field of investment arbitration, I should say in the field of the arbitration protection, uh, investment protection, arbitration was seen, uh, starting with the Washington Convention, uh, as a way to uh, protect uh, the investment. 
this was really uh, the, the solution and uh, we are still more or less in this period. Now, I shall not uh, make a long description of uh, the, of the winters, but I shall deal with one very, very long winter, which started with the uh, Napoleonic Congress. When Napoleon took power in France, he destroyed arbitration. He destroyed arbitration because, contrary to the king and contrary to uh, the people of the revolution, he established uh, a corpus, a group of judges that he was able to control. So he was not fighting against the judge. He wanted the judge to do what he wanted. And they did. So arbitration was completely useless. It was just the contrary. Arbitration could have been a way to escape uh, the uh, power of the emperor. And if you look at uh, the Code of Civil Procedure of 1806, arbitration the arbitration clause is null and void, and uh, arbitration can exist just on the basis of an agreement after the occurrence of uh, the dispute, which limits considerably the role of arbitration. There are appeals against the, the decisions. There are a lot, and the matters who can be, uh, which can be arbitrated, are considerably reduced. And this has been a very long winter because, and a very wide winter, because this was not just in France. This cause was, this cause were uh, introduced in a very great part of the, of the world, in fact, in all civil countries. And you have still but not enough after uh, the uh, model law which was introduced in many countries, but until that time, in many countries, let's say Latin America, for instance, you had exactly the same, well, with very few different, but the same spirit against arbitration, the same was in Italy, the same was in any civil country. And during almost uh, 200 years, arbitration in civil countries has been considerably uh, limited as a result of the political decision of one person. That's very interesting. That's very interesting because when I was hearing these words about Brexit, you can see what political uh, approach can have on arbitration indirectly. And I don't know whether the uh, publicity which we see going everywhere will not have uh, some uh, effect on arbitration. I hope not, but you never. So, now some conclusion and some forecast. The first conclusion is that, but it's not the first conclusion, there's a three conclusions. The main reason, or three main reasons, this is the conclusion, sorry for mixing it up, uh, for uh, the success of arbitration are, and not over the same time, one, the absence of court or of accessible, of accessible courts to decide the issue. It was what, what was it in Rome. It was a diff, from a different perspective what happened during the Cold War. And I think that it is what happened with international arbitration, commercial arbitration today. It is because there is, is there aware, for instance, an international commercial court, probably arbitration would have never had the success that it had uh, at the, in the second part of the 20th century. That's one reason. The second reason is the search for a different type of law. It was in Rome also uh, the case because people could choose between the judge and the arbitrator, and they were expecting a different approach to the law by the arbitrator. It was also the same thing in the French uh, Revolution. On the one hand, during the French Revolution, there was obviously the opposition with the judge of 
is a pre-revolutionary period, but there were also, on the basis of the school of uh, natural law, uh, the wish for a different type of law, more human, more equitable. And you have, as we see <coughs> during uh, the monarchy in France, and with uh, Napoleon, a political agenda using arbitration or fighting arbitration for mainly political reasons. The French king had nothing to do with the duties of arbitration. Their problem was to avoid that the judge uh, could intervene in important issues and make money with, uh, with important issues. And Napoleon has nothing against arbitration. He wanted his own judge to be able to intervene. So these are the three reasons which uh, may have the impact of arbitration. So what will be the future now? And you are going to discuss that during the whole day. I may suggest some ideas. I think uh, in uh, the case of international commercial arbitration, there will be still the lack of appropriate court. So I'm not very afraid of the future of international commercial arbitration. Probably it has to be improved. It has to be improved by uh, introducing more process analysis on the arbitrators in order to be able to fight efficiently against the cost and the duration of arbitration. But to do that, you must achieve a, an arbitration which is tailor-made for the case, très apporté, I would say, and not what we have to do, where uh, we have the, the sort of uh, the same practice, the same procedure applies to any arbitration with the result that it may cost a lot. But I'm not very concerned for the future. For uh, investment arbitration, the situation is probably different. Certainly, many of the criticisms which are made against investment arbitration can be uh, answered. It is possible to introduce a recourse, it is possible to improve the transparency which has been recently improved very much. It is possible to prohibit uh, counsel to be arbitrators and vice versa. There are solutions. But you cannot really fight against the political view uh, which is more and more developed uh, that it is intolerable that private people could control the activities of the state. This is really a political agenda. And to fight this political agenda, you need a different political agenda. And I'm not sure that we we'll have uh, it uh, tomorrow. I don't know. Obviously, it's very difficult uh, to know even where we are today. Uh, I was talking about Rome, but we can think about Greece. Heraclitus was saying nothing is permanent except the change. And this is true. And that's why he was explaining that you never swim twice in the same river. But although I don't know exactly what, where we are, uh, probably a lot has to be done. Yeah, I, I think uh, of what, uh, what was said uh, by one of the heroes of the book by the Prince of Lampedusa, uh, the letter. Uh, he says, uh, because the revolution is coming in Sicily and uh, the young man wants to keep the power, but he understands that something has to be done to be always in power. And he says to his uncle, uh, se vogliamo che tutto rimanga come è, bisogna che tutto cambi. If we want, that everything be, uh, remains as it is, we must change everything. This may be not necessary for the international commercial arbitration. For investment arbitration, I'm not sure that even changing a law 
it could be made. And I conclude on this sad note. Okay.